I'll ask my lawyer right now. Are you? He's speaking to me. Take a seat at the Douglas County Superior Court, where a judge presides over the chilling case of Sahara Tabriz Fakir. Charged with armed robbery, burglary, and murder, Fakir's case captivated the nation as she made outrageous claims and invoked divine intervention in the courtroom. As the hearing begins in Douglas County, Georgia, all eyes are on the defendant, Sahara Tabriz Fakir. At 32 years old, Fakir stands accused of committing a series of heinous crimes, including armed robbery, burglary, and murder. The victim, Jerry Wheeler, a respected local businessman, was brutally stabbed in his own home while innocently preparing dinner. To make matters even more tragic, Wheeler was the father of a dedicated deputy from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office who discovered his lifeless body. As Fakir enters the courtroom, it becomes evident that she fails to grasp the gravity of the charges against her. With an air of nonchalance, she appears seemingly unaffected by the weight of the situation. The judge presiding over the case, known for his composed demeanor, takes Fakir's claim in stride and proceeds with the proceedings. Murder of Jerry Franklin Wheeler. You understand that? In the Masonic Courthouse, I understand that. I understand that this courthouse is a cursed courthouse. Yes, I understand. Okay. And if you are judging me, you are not God fearing, I will have a judgment for you. And everyone else in here is not God fearing. I understand that. However, as the topic shifts to legal representation, Fakir's behavior takes a bizarre turn. The judge, seeking to ensure that Fakir has proper legal counsel, asks her if she has a lawyer, and she gives a shocking response. Do you have a lawyer? I'll ask my lawyer right now. Are you He's speaking to me? Are you going to get a lawyer? Allah is my lawyer right now. And if you do not release me, Allah will have his vengeance on you. Like he did in 2009 when he sent that flood. It's only going to get worse. Her claim leaves the courtroom in stunned silence. Recognizing that Fakir may not have the means to employ a lawyer, the judge informs her of her right to apply for a public defender at no cost. However, Fakir remains steadfast in her conviction that Allah is her ultimate advocate. She demands to be released from the Masonic courthouse, further showcasing her unconventional beliefs and refusal to conform to the legal process. If you cannot employ a lawyer, then you can apply to the public defender's office for an appointment of one at no cost to you. I mean what I said. I'm just trying to inform you of your rights. No, I better be released from that Masonic courthouse. As the hearing nears its end, Fakir's hopes of being granted bond are dashed. The judge firmly states that bond will not be granted that day, prompting Fakir to question the decision. Bond will not be granted today. If you want such a bond, you can make application and have a hearing as to that matter. Do you understand? Why can't I get a bond today? I'm not going to grant a bond today. This is Why? just an initial appearance. Why? Because it's going to have to have a hearing to have the bond. She then goes ahead to take a dig at the news channel covering the hearing Fakir's case, eventually went to trial, and she was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of Jerry Wheeler. Let's head to the Superior Court in Vista, where the trial of Diana Lovejoy, a woman accused of attempting to murder her ex-husband, Greg Mulvihill, unfolds. Get ready as we uncover the alleged involvement of a former Marine sniper, Weldon McDavid, and the shocking lengths Diana went to to gain custody of her son. It all began with a love that turned sour, a marriage that crumbled under the weight of resentment and bitterness. Diana Lovejoy and Greg Mulvihill were once a picture-perfect couple, deeply in love and seemingly destined for a lifetime of happiness. But as time went on, their relationship took a dark turn. They had a beautiful son together, a child who became the center of their world. But behind closed doors, their marriage was falling apart. The couple's differences became irreconcilable, leading them down the path of divorce. Diana and Greg fought tooth and nail for custody of their son, each accusing the other of being an unfit parent. The tension between them reached its peak, and it seemed that there was no end in sight. Desperate and determined to gain full custody of her son, Diana Lovejoy turned to an unlikely ally, Weldon McDavid. Weldon, a former Marine sniper. Together, Diana and Weldon devised a plan to eliminate the obstacle standing in Diana's way, her ex-husband, Greg Mulvihill. The plan was simple yet chillingly effective. Diana would lure Greg to a secluded location where Weldon would lie in wait, ready to carry out the unthinkable. On that fateful night in September, Greg received a call from Diana, asking him to meet her near the Batakitos Lagoon. Oblivious to the danger that awaited him, Greg arrived at the meeting spot, unaware that his life was about to change forever. As Greg stepped out of his car, he was suddenly 
suddenly ambushed by a masked gunman and was struck by a bullet but managed to escape, desperately seeking help. Miraculously, Greg survived the attack, but the identity of the assailants remained a mystery. It wasn't until later that he would reveal the shocking truth. His ex-wife, Diana Lovejoy, was one of the perpetrators. Both Lovejoy and McDavid were arrested, and their trial was one of the most anticipated. Despite the damning evidence against them, Lovejoy maintained her innocence, but this wasn't enough to sway the jury's verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty of the crime of an attempted murder of Greg However, things would take a rather dramatic turn in the courtroom when Lovejoy, her face filled with disbelief and shock, suddenly fainted. Lovejoy had to be taken out of the courtroom in an ambulance. As for Weldon McDavid, the jury found him guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. His involvement in the sinister plan had been exposed, and he too would face the full weight of the law. After careful consideration, the judge handed down the sentence. Diana Lovejoy was to spend 25 years to life in prison, with no possibility of parole. As she heard the verdict, Lovejoy immediately burst into tears. McDavid, on the other hand, was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison for his role in the crime. Scholar, you have a right to speak this morning if you'd like. You don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. you all. You're garbage. Next, we take a seat at a Minnesota courtroom where sentencing for Jalissa Thaler is underway. Thaler was found guilty of brutally murdering her own six-year-old son and then driving around town with his lifeless body. In a small Minnesota community, a horrifying crime unfolded, leaving a young life tragically cut short. Jalissa Thaler, a mother who was supposed to protect and nurture her child, instead committed an unspeakable act of violence. The victim of this heinous crime was her own six-year-old son, Eli Hart. The events leading up to this shocking incident began with a contentious custody battle between Thaler and Eli's father, Tori Hart. The custody dispute had reached a boiling point, with tensions escalating between the parents. Little did anyone know that this bitter dispute would end in such a heart-wrenching tragedy. The discovery of Eli's body came after police stopped Thaler in a heavily damaged vehicle with a blown-out back windshield. As they investigated further, they made the horrifying realization that Eli's lifeless body was in the trunk, alongside the murder weapon. It was a scene that would forever haunt those who witnessed it. The case against Thaler was built upon a meticulous gathering of evidence across multiple crime scenes. Surveillance photos captured Thaler and Eli leaving her apartment building together for the final time, providing a glimpse into their last moments together. Body camera images from the traffic stop further solidified the connection between Thaler and the crime, but it didn't stop there. Investigators delved into Thaler's web searches, uncovering a chilling premeditation. She had reportedly gone into a gun's ammunition store asking staff for ammunition that could have blown the biggest hole. Just 10 days before the death of Eli, Eli. Social workers had granted Thaler full custody of the six-year-old boy, despite his father making several complaints about Thaler, who had a long history of drug abuse, paranoia, and other mental health issues. These searches painted a disturbing picture of a mother who had planned the unthinkable. The evidence presented during the trial left no room for doubt about Thaler's guilt. The jury, after carefully considering the overwhelming evidence, delivered a verdict of guilty on both first and second degree murder charges. The courtroom was filled with tension and raw emotions as the judge prepared to deliver the sentence for Jalissa Thaler's heinous crime. But before the final verdict could be announced, Thaler unleashed a shocking and disrespectful outburst that left everyone in the courtroom stunned. Proclaiming her innocence with fervor, Thaler directed profanity toward those present, displaying a complete disregard for the gravity of her actions. Ms. Scholar, you have a right to speak this morning if you'd like. You don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say so. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. F you all. You're garbage. Despite Thaler's disrespectful actions, the judge maintained composure and proceeded to hand down the harshest possible sentence life in prison without the possibility of parole. Nothing I do would bring justice to this situation. Nothing I do would relieve any of the pain that you caused by doing that. But what is, according to law, the just and fair sentence for what you did. This is what Mr. Allard said, and that is life in prison without the possibility of parole. It was a moment of justice, ensuring that Thaler would never have the opportunity to harm another innocent life again. As the court proceedings ended and everyone filed out of the court, Thaler was seen subtly showing a middle finger to the camera. 
Let's head to a Memphis court where a dramatic court session is underway for 20-year-old Shelby Isaac, who is currently uncontrollable after she learned her fate. The young woman was in court after she murdered a man, his pregnant girlfriend, and their unborn baby. The cause of such senseless murder? A dispute over hair extensions. Known for her demanding and entitled behavior, 20-year-old Shelby Isaac was no stranger to causing a scene over the smallest inconveniences, but no one could have predicted the extent to which her behavior would escalate. It all started when Shelby purchased hair extensions from a local style named Eddie E.J.'s Tate. After some time, Shelby, dissatisfied with her purchase, decided to meet up with Tate for perhaps a refund on January 22, 2016. However, in a fit of rage, Karen allegedly pulled out a weapon and shot Eddie and his girlfriend, Edwina Thomas, who was eight weeks pregnant at the time. After the shooting, witnesses say Isaac went through Tate's pockets. At the time of the murder, Shelby was just 18 years old. As expected, her actions had consequences, and she was swiftly apprehended by law enforcement. The wheels of justice were set in motion, leading to a trial that would captivate the nation. As the trial progressed, the courtroom was filled with tension. The jury carefully considered the evidence presented, weighing the testimonies and the arguments put forth by both the prosecution and the defense. Finally, after days of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. Shelby was found guilty of the charges against her. When the jury finally found guilty of second-degree murder as included in count one, Signed by the, the, jury. the words echoed through the courtroom, and Karen's world came crashing down. Overwhelmed by the weight of the verdict, she collapsed to the floor helplessly. Despite the dramatic reaction, the judge continued with the business at hand. Ask count two of the indictment. Will the jury find the man guilty of second-degree murder as included in count one? Yes. Shelby was convicted of two counts of second-degree murder, as well as reckless homicide and criminally negligent homicide of the unborn baby. Despite her screaming and crying for her mother, Shelby, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Those men were shot just, just shot in self defense boom, 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 you know. They weren't cut up, they weren't sliced up, no OJ jazz, you know. And he said, I did the most horrendous crime in the whole wide world. Not true? I guess not. Next, we delve into the astonishing tale of Aileen Warnos, an American serial killer whose crimes in the late 1980s and early 1990s sent shockwaves through the nation. Take your seat at the Florida Supreme Court as we unravel Warnos's troubled upbringing in Rochester, Michigan, to her harrowing experiences as a sex worker, her murderous rampage, and the shocking aftermath that awaited her in prison. To understand the shocking journey of Aileen Warnos, we must first delve into her troubled upbringing and early life. Born on February 29, 1956, in in Rochester, Michigan, Aileen Warnos's life took a dark turn from the very beginning. Warnos's mother was only 14 years old when she married her father, who was just 18 at the time. Unfortunately, their young love was short-lived, and Warnos never had the chance to meet her father. Instead, she was raised by her maternal grandparents, who legally adopted her and her brother. Growing up in a modest house in a quiet suburban neighborhood, Warnos's childhood seemed ordinary at first glance. However, behind closed doors, she experienced unimaginable pain and trauma that would shape her future in unimaginable ways. Warnos's early years were marred by sexual abuse and trauma. These experiences left deep scars on her psyche, leading to a lifetime of mental health struggles. At the age of 15, she was thrown out of the house after a dispute with her grandfather, and that was when everything totally went downhill. When she was 22, she embarked on a murderous rampage, killing several men. Warnos claimed that each of her victims had either raped or attempted to rape her, fueling her belief that she was acting in self-defense. There's no sense in having me tormented for the rest of my life when I don't deserve to be tormented. I did what anybody else would do. But as the body count rose, law enforcement agencies across the country began to piece together the horrifying truth. The first victim, Richard Mallory, was found dead in 1989. His murder set off a chain of events that would send shockwaves through the nation. Warnos continued her killing spree, targeting men she encountered while working as a sex worker. David Spears, Charles Karskadden, Peter Seams, Troy Burress, Charles Humphreys, and Walter Antonio were all brutally murdered by Warnos. Each victim met 
had a tragic end, their lives cut short by a woman consumed by anger and a thirst for revenge. As the body count continued to rise, law enforcement agencies launched a massive manhunt to capture Warnos. Finally, in 1991, she was apprehended in Florida, bringing an end to her deadly reign of terror. Warnos's arrest marked a turning point in the investigation. Her trial captivated the nation as the shocking details of her crimes were laid bare for all to see. The prosecution painted a picture of a cold-blooded killer, while the defense argued that Warnos had acted in self-defense. Throughout the trial, Warnos exhibited signs of mental instability, often breaking down in tears or lashing out at those around her. Her turbulent emotions only added to the drama and intensity of the courtroom proceedings. After much deliberation, the jury reached a verdict. Aileen Warnos was found guilty of six of the murders and sentenced to death. As the years went by, Warnos's case continued to captivate the public's attention. She granted interviews to various media outlets, sharing her side of the story while claiming her death sentence was an unjust verdict. Yeah, thanks a lot. I lost my f***ing life because of it. Couldn't even get a fair trial. Couldn't even get a fair investigation or nothing. Couldn't even have my appeals right. You sabotaged my ass, society, and the cops, and the system. A raped woman got executed. On October 9th, 2002, she was put to death by lethal injection. It was the final chapter in a story that shocked and fascinated the world. Erica May Butts and Shanita Latrice Cunningham. At a Charleston courtroom, Erica and Shanita, two lesbian lovers, were found guilty of the brutal murder of three-year-old Serenity Richardson, who was under their care. The abuse inflicted upon Serenity was unimaginable, with repeated beatings using a belt and plastic coat hangers. The courtroom scene was nothing short of dramatic, as Erica and Shanita collapsed and wailed upon hearing their life sentences. To understand the events that unfolded, we must first explore the background and relationship between Erica May Butts and Shanita Latrice Cunningham. Cunningham. These two women, both 25 years old at the time, were deeply intertwined in each other's lives. Erica May Butts was born and raised in Somerville, South Carolina. She had a reputation for being a caring and nurturing individual, which made her a trusted figure in her community. Shanita Latrice Cunningham, on the other hand, had a more troubled past. She had a difficult upbringing, marked by instability and hardships. Shanita's childhood experiences left her yearning for stability and love, which she found in her relationship with Erica. It was through their shared experiences and mutual support that Erica and Shanita romantic relationship blossomed. In 2009, tragedy struck when Serenity Richardson, a three-year-old girl, entered their lives. Serenity was the daughter of Yeshia Richardson, a childhood friend of Erica's. Leshia, who lived in Detroit, had entrusted her daughter's care to Erica, who was Serenity's godmother. As the days went by, Erica and Shanita's treatment of Serenity took a dark and sinister turn. What was meant to be a safe and nurturing environment turned into a house of horrors for the innocent three-year-old. Erica and Shanita resorted to using a belt and plastic coat hangers as instruments of punishment. The beatings were relentless and left visible marks all over Serenity's body. The motive behind the abuse remains unclear. Erica later admitted to the police that she whipped Serenity with a belt as punishment for urinating on the floor. However, this explanation failed to justify the extreme violence and cruelty inflicted upon the innocent child. It was only when paramedics arrived at the scene that the full extent of the abuse became apparent. Despite their efforts, it was too late to save Serenity. The little girl had suffered immeasurable pain and cruelty, all at the hands of those who were supposed to protect her. The arrest and subsequent trial of Erica May Butts and Shanita Latrice Cunningham sent shockwaves through the community. The details of the abuse were horrifying, and the public demanded justice for Serenity Richardson. The most dramatic moment of the trial came when Judge Deidre Richardson delivered the sentence. Erica and Shanita had collapsed and wailed uncontrollably upon hearing their life sentences. The mother of Butts was physically thrown out by three staff members after shouting loudly at her daughter to get up and then screaming, I can't leave my baby like this. My baby is out. As Erica and Shanita were wheeled out of the courtroom, the weight of their actions hung heavy in the air. Amber Pereira. Next, we head to a Florida courtroom where Circuit Judge Christopher Sabella is about to sentence Amber Pereira. Pereira was found guilty of DUI manslaughter after ramming into a Hyundai sedan and killing a family of three after their vehicle skidded off and hit other cars, causing all vehicles to go aflame. An extremely drunk Amber Pereira decided on April 10, 2017 to drive her vehicle at a speed of 120 miles per hour at five seconds on Selman Expressway. Not long after, her Kia vehicle collided with the back of a Hyundai sedan 
sedan, sending it careening into the westbound lanes. Inside that car were Louise and Rita Felipak, along with their eight-year-old daughter, Georgia. Their lives were about to be tragically cut short. The impact of the collision caused a chain reaction as two other vehicles crashed into the Peck family's car. The scene erupted into a fiery explosion, engulfing the vehicles and trapping the innocent family inside. As chaos ensued, Amber Pereira made a fateful decision. Instead of stopping to assess the damage or offer help, she continued driving, leaving the scene of the horrific accident behind her. Meanwhile, all three members of the Filipak family died at the scene, but her escape was short-lived. Just a few minutes later, Amber's damaged car came to a halt after a tire fell off, unable to continue. It was at this moment that authorities caught up with her, bringing her to face the consequences of her actions. The trial that followed would reveal the shocking truth behind Amber Pereira's reckless behavior. The courtroom was filled with tension and grief as the trial began. The prosecution wasted no time in presenting a compelling case against Amber Pereira. They painted a vivid picture of her reckless behavior and the devastating consequences it had on the Peck family. The evidence against Amber was overwhelming. Witnesses testified to her erratic driving, her disregard for traffic laws, and her complete lack of concern for the safety of others on the road. The prosecution presented photos and videos that captured the horrifying aftermath of the crash, leaving the jury and spectators in shock. The defense, however, attempted to shift the blame. They claimed that Amber had suffered a seizure at the time of the crash, arguing that it was a medical emergency beyond her control. But as the trial progressed, doubts began to surface. The arrest report told a different story. There was no mention of a medical emergency, casting doubt on Amber's claims. It seemed that her seizure defense was nothing more than an attempt to evade responsibility for her actions. And then came the bombshell revelation. The results of the toxicology test showed that Amber Pereira had a blood alcohol level of 0.10 at the time of the crash. She had been driving under the influence, further solidifying the prosecution's case against her. The true extent of Amber's recklessness and disregard for the lives of others became painfully clear. The Felipak family's tragic fate was a direct result of her choices. As the trial neared its end, both the prosecution and the defense delivered their closing arguments. The prosecution emphasized the devastating loss suffered by the Peck family and the need for justice to be served. The defense, on the other hand, continued to cling to their seizure defense, desperately trying to salvage Amber's future. Finally, after days of emotional testimony and compelling arguments, the moment of truth arrived. The judge, recognizing the severity of the crime and the lives that had been lost, delivered the verdict. Amber Pereira was found guilty on multiple charges, including vehicular manslaughter and driving under the influence. The judge sentenced her to 50 years in prison, ensuring that she would pay for her actions for the rest of her life. Yes, ma'am, your life is ruined, but you also ruined a lot of lives and ended three lives. As soon as she heard the verdict, Amber began sobbing in the courtroom. Taylor Shea Business. Our final case unfolds at a Brown County courtroom where the dark and disturbing case of Taylor Shea Business is being presided over. Shea Business found herself in court after she gruesomely murdered and dismembered her partner. From the gruesome crime she committed to her explosive outburst during the trial, and finally, her jaw-dropping reaction to the sentence. Get ready to be shocked as we explore the unbelievable details surrounding Taylor Shea Business and the heinous acts that have left the community in disbelief. Taylor Shea Business, a 25-year-old woman was living a seemingly ordinary life in Green Bay, Wisconsin. But behind closed doors, a dark and sinister world was unfolding. It all began in February 2022, when Taylor's life took a sinister turn. Taylor had been involved in a tumultuous relationship with Shad Therian, a 24-year-old man. Their relationship was marred by drug abuse and violence, creating a toxic environment that would eventually lead to a horrifying outcome. Prosecutors revealed that on the fateful day of the crime, Therian and Shea Business had been smoking methamphetamine in the basement of Therian's mother's home. The drug-induced haze clouded their judgment, and tensions escalated to a boiling point. In a fit of rage, Shabuznas strangled Therian, ending his life in a moment of unimaginable violence. But the horror didn't stop there. Shabuznas, driven by a disturbed mind, proceeded to decapitate and dismember Therian's body. The gruesome details of the crime are enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. Shabuznas scattered the body parts throughout the house, and even left some in a vehicle. The sheer brutality and disregard for human life displayed in this 
act shocked the entire community. The discovery of Therian's remains was nothing short of a nightmare. It was Therian's mother who made the horrifying discovery, finding her son's head in a bucket in the basement. The scene was one of unimaginable horror, leaving the family and the community traumatized. Authorities wasted no time in apprehending Shabuznes. On February 23rd, 2022, she was arrested and taken into custody. The evidence against her was overwhelming, and the community demanded justice for the heinous crime that had been committed. As the case unfolded, it became clear that Shabuznes had meticulously planned and executed this gruesome act. The level of premeditation and brutality displayed was chilling. It left investigators and the legal system grappling with the depths of human depravity. The trial that followed was a harrowing experience for all involved. The courtroom was filled with tension as the prosecution presented the evidence, painting a vivid picture of the horrifying events that took place on that fateful day. Throughout the trial, Shea Business displayed a range of emotions, from anger to indifference. Her outburst in the courtroom shocked everyone present, as she seemed to revel in the attention and the chaos she created. At some point, she even attacked her own attorney. It was a chilling display of a disturbed mind. Despite her defense attorney's attempts to humanize her, portraying her as someone capable of rehabilitation, the jury saw through the facade. In July, Shabuznes was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide, third-degree sexual assault, and mutilating a corpse. Shabuznes, now in court for her sentencing, showed little remorse for her actions. When allowed to speak on her own behalf, she simply replied, no, there isn't. Her lack of remorse only further fueled the outrage in the courtroom. After carefully considering the evidence, the judge announced the sentence, life in prison without the possibility of parole. The courtroom erupted in a mix of emotions, ranging from relief to anger. The community finally felt a sense of justice being served. Shea Business, on the other hand, didn't betray any emotion at the prospect of spending the rest of her life in prison. Instead, she had a weird, unexplainable look on her face. As Shea Business was led away, the weight of her actions finally seemed to sink in. It was a moment that left many in the courtroom reflecting on the fragility of life and the consequences of one's choices. The sentencing of Taylor Shabuznes marked the end of a chapter in this harrowing case. This video showing when a Karen goes to prison makes you question the depths of human behavior when faced with the consequences that come with their actions. For some intriguing videos like this, click on the card showing on your screen and I'll be waiting.